DNA Structure and Replication Part 1 will have its primary focus on the experimental work that preceded Watson and Crick's determination of DNA structure. The essential ideas are genetic information in DNA can be accurately copied and can be translated to make the proteins needed by the cell. The structure of DNA is ideally suited to its function. Let me start this unit with a review of fundamental DNA structure, and here's the IB syllabus statement of relevance. Explain how a DNA double helix is composed of antiparallel strands of nucleotides linked by hydrogen bonding between the complementary base pairs. In this image, we see a short segment of DNA. Each nucleotide monomer is composed of a deoxyribose sugar, a phosphate group, and a base attached to the number one carbon of the sugar. There are four bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. The purine bases, A and G, pair with pyrimidine bases, T and C. The two strands are anti-parallel. The double helix is composed of two strands of DNA with the complementary base pairing toward the center of the molecule. The base pairs are held together by hydrogen bonds. In this image, we can see the 5 prime, 3 prime, 3 prime, 5 prime notation. The numbers refer to the carbons on the deoxyribose sugar. The anti-parallel orientation is clear. The sugar phosphate backbone of the molecule is held together by covalent bonds. The phosphate group of a nucleotide is attached to the third carbon of the sugar. Thus, the covalent links between nucleotides would be here, here, here on this strand, here, here, and here on this strand. Could you draw a short segment of DNA molecule showing the structure of single nucleotides using circles, pentagons, and rectangles to represent phosphates, pentose sugars, and bases. In this image, you can see the pentagonal sugars, the circular phosphate, and the base represented as a rectangle. But notice that the purine bases, A and G, are represented as larger structures than the pyrimidine bases, T and C. The purines are two ring bases, while the pyrimidines are one ring bases. So let's move on to two new IB syllabus statements. Describe the supercoiling of DNA, refer to nucleosomes. Explain the role of nucleosomes in the regulation of transcription. While we sometimes use the terms DNA and chromosome interchangeably, a chromosome is technically defined as DNA wrapped around protein. And if you research the term chromosome, the image Seen here appears the X-shaped structure represents DNA that has undergone replication displaying sister chromatids, genetically identical chromatids, and it has condensed to become visible. Replication happens during interphase. Condensation happens during prophase of mitosis or meiosis. The association of DNA wrapped two and a half times around histone proteins, eight histone proteins, is called a nucleosome. The nucleosome is the fundamental mechanism by which DNA, the molecule, is packed. Sequences of nucleotides along the DNA code for sequences of amino acids in a polypeptide, and functional protein determines the phenotype, the look of the organism. But some DNA code has repetitive sequences, sequences that are non-coding regions, and these repetitive sequences are excellent for use in DNA profiling for crime cases or paternity cases or immigration cases. DNA condensation can also influence transcription of DNA into mRNA. Increased condensation reduces transcription. Through the early 1900s and into the 1950s, scientists weren't sure that DNA was 
the hereditary molecule that we think of today. It wasn't until 1953 that the structure of DNA was known. Watson and Crick announced the structure of DNA with a one-page paper in the journal Nature that earned them a Nobel Prize. While the details of this cartoon are inaccurate, Watson and Crick did very little of the experimental work that they used to develop their model of DNA. Watson and Crick stood on the shoulders of others. In terms of discovering the molecule of heredity, the simplicity of DNA was misleading. How can a molecule with no more than four different monomers, A, T, C, and G, direct the complexity that we see in living things? Most scientists of the time felt that protein, with all of its complexity, was the hereditary molecule. In 1865, Mendel referred to traits that were inherited, and he described these traits as being discrete particles. In 1869, DNA was isolated by the Swiss physician, Meischer, and Meischer referred to it as nuclein. In 1909, the German scientist Wilhelm Johansson named the Mendelian unit of heredity gene. And in 1928, Griffiths, Frederick Griffiths, was demonstrating that when DNA was taken up by bacteria, their character changed. Griffiths referred to this as transformation. So let's look at some of the principal experiments that provided the evidence of DNA's role as the molecule of heredity, the Avery Griffiths experiments and the Hershey Chase experiments, as well as the evidence used by Watson and Crick to determine DNA structure, Chargoff's data, and the Franklin Wilkins X-ray crystallography data. Known as the Avery Griffiths experiments that span 1928 to 1944, Griffiths, then Avery, showed that DNA was moved between bacteria and altered their phenotype. Here's what they did. Using live encapsulated bacteria, they knew their bacteria were virulent and would kill a mouse. However, live non-encapsulated bacteria were not virulent and could not kill a mouse. For the bacteria, the encapsulation was protective against the mouse defenses, and this allowed the encapsulated bacteria to be virulent. When they heat killed virulent encapsulated bacteria and injected it into the mouse, the mouse lived. But when the heat killed encapsulated bacteria were mixed with live, non-lethal, unencapsulated bacteria, the mouse died. In other words, the live, non-lethal, unencapsulated bacteria had changed it had become lethal. It had picked up the virulent factor from the dead, heat-killed, encapsulated bacteria. Avery, in 1944, took the DNA, the DNA from heat-killed, virulent bacteria, and mixed it with live, non-virulent bacteria. And these bacteria became encapsulated and virulent. He determined that DNA was the transforming factor. The next piece of evidence came from Hershey and Chase, and here's the IB syllabus statement. Describe the Hershey-Chase experiments in terms of how they provided evidence that DNA was the genetic material. In 1951, Hershey and Chase did two elegant experiments to support the work of Avery and Griffiths. They worked with a bacteriophage, a virus that infects bacteria. Just for some background information, before explaining the work of Hershey and Chase, the bacteriophage is a virus composed of a protein coat with a molecule of DNA within. The virus lands on a bacterium, the bacterial membrane is here, and proceeds to insert its DNA into the bacterium. This is called viral infection. Here is a micrograph of three bacteriophage viruses inserting their DNA into a bacterium. The viral DNA then combines with the host DNA, the bacterial DNA, to make new viral proteins, new viral DNA, so, such that new virus particles are made. Here's a micrograph that shows a bacterium and the protein coat of a virus that has already inserted its DNA into the bacterium. We can see new virus particles within the bacterium. The DNA of the virus has combined with the bacterial DNA, and unbeknownst to the bacterium, it is making new viruses. Soon the bacterial cell will burst open, 
releasing the new virus particles, and they will go and infect other cells. Here is a micrograph of a bacteriophage squash with its DNA all spread about. So remember, the question was, was DNA or protein the hereditary material? And here is the first of two Hershey Chase experiments. They radioactively labeled the protein coat of the viruses they were culturing. They used radioactive sulfur because protein contains sulfur, but DNA does not. They allowed the radioactive viruses to infect bacterium. Then they blended the mixture of bacterial cells to shake off the viral protein coats. Then they examined the mixture for radioactivity. Where was the radioactivity? Was it within the cells or not? And with radioactively labeled sulfur, the radioactivity was not within the cells. In their second experiment, they radioactively labeled DNA using radioactive phosphorus because DNA has phosphorus but protein does not. They allowed the radioactive viruses to infect a bacterium, then they blended the mixture of bacterial cells to shake off the viral protein coats, then they examined the mixture for radioactivity. Was the radioactivity within the cells or not? With radioactively labeled phosphorus, the DNA, radioactivity was within the cells. DNA must be the hereditary molecule. From 1949 to 1952, a fellow named Chargoff was working on the composition of DNA from various species and found a very interesting pattern with the bases. Adenine and thymine had a one-to-one -one ratio within every species, and cytosine and guanine had a one-to-one -one ratio within every species. And the purine-pyrimidine ratio was one-to-one -one for every species. Now, you should recognize the significance of this, but just to refresh your memory, adenine, a purine, is always paired with thymine, a pyrimidine. Guanine, a purine, is always paired with cytosine, a pyrimidine. And that brings us to Rosalind Franklin. The IB syllabus statement is, describe the work of Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins in terms of the evidence they gathered that helped Watson and Crick elucidate the structure of DNA. In the early 1950s, Rosalind Franklin was working at King's College in London on a technique called X-ray diffraction. She passed X-rays through a crystallized piece of DNA to produce the image seen here on the right, which indicates a double helical structure. Franklin's analysis of the X-ray diffraction data hinted at the double helix, but she was not able to elucidate the structure of DNA seen here. Franklin's conclusions based on the analysis of the X-ray diffraction photograph were that DNA had a width of 2 nanometers, that purines and pyrimidines must be paired, otherwise the width would not be 2 nanometers, and that the molecule was a double helix. Rosalind Franklin unfortunately died of ovarian cancer at age 38 and might very well have joined Watson and Crick in receiving the Nobel Prize in 1962, but Nobel Prizes are not awarded posthumously. Watson and Crick, using all the information gathered by others, put together a model of DNA using clamps and ring stands. Here they are standing by their model. Watson and Crick used a model to elucidate the structure of DNA. The IB syllabus statement is, describe how Watson and Crick elucidated the structure of DNA using model making. They used ring stands and clamps to make a model of DNA based on what was known about DNA at the time, evidence gathered by others. They published a one-page paper in Nature and received a Nobel Prize in 1962 along with a co-worker of Rosalind Franklin's named Maurice Wilkins. The beauty of Watson and Crick's model allowed them to immediately see how the molecule replicated. Describe how the structure of DNA suggested a mechanism for replication. As the structure of DNA unfolded before their eyes, Watson and Crick could immediately hypothesize 
about replication. They put forward this image here to explain replication with complementary base pairing as the perfect mechanism to build the new strand against a template strand on each side of the double helix after it was unwound. Notice the arrows here to show the daughter strands being built in the same direction against the parental or template strands. Now that both strands were built in the same direction is not correct, as we'll see later in this series, but their theory on replication was otherwise correct. I mentioned earlier in the movie that DNA's simplicity, being composed of only four monomers, A, T, C, and G, was what misled scientists into thinking that the hereditary molecule was likely protein. But now, with all that you understand about DNA, you can see that a sequence of nucleotide bases along a strand of DNA is in fact the code to determine phenotype. DNA through mRNA and protein, DNA is the hereditary molecule. A gene is a linear sequence of nucleotides along a segment of DNA that provides the coded instructions for the synthesis of RNA, which when translated into protein, leads to the expression of hereditary characters. Now DNA replication is called semi-conservative because parental strands seen here in blue serve as the templates against which the new strands are built. The two new DNA molecules once formed are each composed of one parental strand and one new strand. Let me show you more images of semi-conservative replication. The IB syllabus statements are state that DNA replication is semi-conservative and depends on complementary base pairing. Analyze the results of Messelson and Stahl's experiments that provided support for the theory of semi-conservative replication of DNA. DNA replication wouldn't have to be semi-conservative. There are other possibilities, such as conservative, where the parental strands remain together with the new strands paired together, or another possible replication mechanism would be dispersive. Here's another image of possible replication theories, conservative, dispersive, and semi-conservative. In conservative replication, the original template strands remain together while the new strands join together. Dispersive replication appears like this, and semi-conservative replication has the parental strands paired with the new strands. Messelson and Stahl performed an elegant experiment using DNA of different molecular weights by virtue of exposing some DNA to heavy nitrogen, nitrogen-15, using the nucleotides of nitrogen-15 to build the heavy DNA. They also used a centrifuge, a machine that would spin the DNA, that would differentiate the DNA of different weights, as you can see right here. Heavy DNA, light nitrogen-14 DNA, and a mixture of both spun in a centrifuge to create bands. Now, in their experiment, they started with the heavy DNA, but they allowed the rep replication to occur in a medium with the light nitrogen-14. Now, if replication were semi-conservative, they could predict that the DNA after the first generation of replication would have no DNA that would spin down to the heavy level because all the DNA after the first replication would be a mixture of heavy and light and their band would be intermediate between the heavy and the light bands and their hypothesis was supported. They predicted that after the second round of replication which you can see here a light band would appear because of these strands and their hypothesis was supported. With further generations of replication the light band became thicker and thicker as more and more of the DNA was strictly nitrogen-14, light nitrogen DNA. Once again, they started the experiment with heavy DNA, heavy nitrogen-15 DNA, but after one generation of replication, the heavy band did not appear in the centrifuge tube as all the DNA having been replicated in a semi-conservative manner was a hybrid 
of heavy and light. After the second generation, a light band appeared because of the new strands being synthesized with light nitrogen-14 nucleotides. If replication happens to be conservative, then a heavy band would always appear in the centrifuge tube. But if replication is semi-conservative, then a heavy band disappears after the first replication as all the new strands are hybrids of heavy and light. If replication were dispersive, then no fully light band would ever appear. You can compare the three possible theories of replication here, remembering that the use of the centrifuge to separate the bands is very important. Conservative replication would produce two bands, a light and heavy, and the heavy band would always exist in the centrifuge tube. In semi-conservative replication, the heavy band would immediately disappear following the first replication, and while hybrid bands would persist, the frequency of the light bands would increase. In dispersive replication, after the first replication, a hybrid band appears and remains throughout further replications. No light band ever appears. Here is a very simple image of semi-conservative replication. The red-blue coloration displays the semi-conservative nature of the replication process. And that brings us to the end of IB Bio DNA Structure and Replication Part 1. DNA Structure Replication Part 2 will take a very close look at the structure of DNA. Part 3 will focus on the details of replication.